Okay, so um, uh, we saw last time uh, one important property of the Schur functions, I guess two times ago, which was that uh, it's characterized by uh, two things. One is this, uh, yeah, it's here. So one is that it satisfies the uh, Cauchy identity, and the second is that it is uh, it is given by an upper triangular transition matrix from uh, monomial symmetry function. So these two properties characterize uh, Schur functions. Do I have the statement? Yeah, I think that was even before. Yeah, so. So the first thing is that, uh, yeah, it, it forms an orthonormal basis because it satisfies the Cauchy identity. And uh, that's, uh, so So what if, so if we want to show that something is equal to the shoot function, we only need to show those two properties. So let me just write that down again clearly. So this is lecture four. So shoot functions are characterized by uh, the two properties. One is that S lambda is equal to summation, let's say M lambda plus summation mu less than lambda, K lambda mu, M mu. And the second is that uh, product one over one minus x i y j i greater than or equal to one j greater than or equal to one is equal to sum over lambda s lambda x s lambda. Okay, so these two properties characterize two functions and in fact uh, over determine them. So in if we can, uh, so today I'm going to uh, give you the combinatorial description of shoot function and I'm going to prove that it coincides with uh, Cauchy's definition that we've looked at before by proving that it satisfies uh, these two properties here. So now let's, uh, to give the combinatorial uh, definition of Schur functions, I need to introduce uh, the notion of se a semi-standard Young tableau. So firstly, remember that if you're given a partition lambda, uh, you can uh, you can write down its Young diagram. So for example, if you have the partition uh, 5431, it has a Young diagram, which has five boxes in the first row, four boxes in the second row, three boxes in the third row, and one box. So I said earlier that we draw, draw boxes because we want to put numbers inside them. And so a semi standard Young tableau of shape lambda is a filling. of the Young diagram of lambda by non-negative, uh, by positive integers, such that firstly, uh, the entries increase weakly along rows And the entries increase 
strictly along columns. So uh, in this, uh, if I take this five, four, three, one shape, uh, here's an example of a young diagram, one, three, three, five, eight. And now I'm like completely leaving out the boxes because it just becomes uh, more cumbersome to draw the boxes and then fill them up. So you just write the numbers uh, nicely arranged so that they reflect where the boxes are. So this is a semi-standard Young tableau of shape uh, five, four, three. So you notice that uh, each column is strictly increasing and each row is weakly increasing. So now uh, the um, uh, other important invariant of a semi-standard Young tableau besides its shape is its weight. So, uh, so uh, we say that, so this let's, we'll, we'll usually denote tableau by the letter T. Uh, so a tableau T has weight, mu one, mu two, if it has mu one ones, mu i, if it i occurs, mu i times in t. So the weight of this tableau is Uh, one occurs only once, two occurs once, three occurs three times, four occurs only twice, five occurs twice, six occurs um, twice, mm, seven does not occur, eight occurs once, and then we can uh, put zeros or we can just uh, end the thing there uh, to indicate that nothing else occurs. And sometimes we are not, in, uh, we, we want to limit the number of letters that we use. So we just have some uh, notation. So this mu notice here is not necessarily a partition. It's just a sequence of non-negative integers. But the sum of these mu's should add up to the sum of uh, the parts of lambda. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we'll just have some notation now. So S S Y T lambda will denote uh, semi standard Young tableau of shape lambda, but sometimes I will say S S Y T lambda n means that. Um, entries are all less than or equal to n. And uh, then sometimes we would want to specify the exact weight. Since weight is mu. Okay, so, and uh, given a tableau T, we'll write X raised to T is going to be X one raised to mu one, x2 raised to mu2, where mu is the weight of t. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, and now just the uh, first uh, lemma about semi-standard Young tableau. If there exists, a semi-standard Young tableau of shape lambda and weight mu, then um, lambda dominates mu. So I'll remind you what lambda dominates mu means in the proof itself. So, uh, so if you have a semi-standard Young tableau, then notice that all the occurrences of one have to be in the first row because the columns are strictly increasing. And all the occurrences of, uh, so that means that lambda one 
is greater than or equal to mu one. And all the occurrences of two have to happen in the first two rows because if two happens in the third row, then you cannot have strictly, you know, you cannot strictly decrease two times from two and still remain positive. So, so all the occurrences of two occur in the first two rows. Uh, and so all the occurrences of one and two occur in the first two rows. And so on. And of course, uh, the sum of lambda has to be the sum of mu. Now, here mu is not really a, a, a partition. That's why when you talk about dominance, uh, I have to be a little more careful. But what it's one way you can think about if mu is a partition, then this is exactly the dominance order. Otherwise, anyway, these inequalities still hold. So in particular, if, if mu is a partition, then this is a dominance order. So, okay, so we'll just uh, leave it at that. Okay, so, uh, okay, so now let me come to the... Uh, uh, hello, sir. Yeah. What about converse? Uh, the converse is true, but I won't prove it. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, there's a. Okay, so let's just one second. Uh, okay, so now we come to the combinatorial definition of shoot functions. Uh, so it is defined to be summation uh, over all t in S. So uh, I should be a little careful here. So maybe first I will define it in n variables. So let's just pick some n. S S Y T Lambda N. And it is X to the power. Of T. So a priori, it's not even clear that this is a symmetric function. Um, so, uh, so for example, uh, we can just do a very simple example. S21 in X1, X2. So you need to write down the semi standard Young tableau uh, of shape 2 1 with letters 1 and 2. And uh, there's, uh, I guess there's uh, 1, 1, 2. Uh, there's 1, 2, 2. And uh, that's it, right? Today. Yeah, so this is just x1 squared x2 plus x1 x2 squared so you have to have at least one two because this entry has to be two. Oh, oh uh, yeah and uh, you have to have at least one one because uh, this entry has to be one because it's strictly increased so if you're in two variables then this is this but if you work with three variables Then you have a lot more choice here. So you have one, one, two, one, one, three. So that takes care of the things with one and one. Uh, then you can have uh, one, two, two, one, two, three. So that takes care of, uh, I guess, one and two and so on. So I'll let you uh, write down all the terms here. So you'll have uh, somebody knows the exact number, right? What's it? Seven or nine or something. 
terms. Yeah. Eight of them. Eight, eight of them. Adjoint representation. Yeah, average mind answers. So, yeah, so there are eight of them. And as Apurva says, easy way to remember is that it's the adjoint representation. Okay, so that's uh, that's the thing. And now the point is that uh, this uh, this kind of definition has the stability property that uh, if you set uh, capital S lambda x one x n and you take the n plus first variable to be zero, this is going to be x1, xn, because what happens is when you set the nth variable to be zero, uh, it is as if in this sum, you're ignoring all the semi-standard Young tab tableau where uh, n plus one occurs. So then you're restricting yourself to semi-standard Young tableau where n plus one doesn't occur. And so you're looking at the sum over SS n. So this has the stability property, and therefore we get um, uh, we get uh, well. There's a slight issue here. Uh, we still don't know that uh, this is a symmetric function. So so maybe uh, we'll come to that a little later. Okay. So uh, so what I'm going to show is that. Uh, this uh, this capital S coincides with the little s. I'll do that uh, by proving uh, this uh, Cauchy identity. This Cauchy identity here actually implies that uh, the functions uh, on the right hand side are symmetric because the left hand side is symmetric in each set of variables, the vari set of variables x and the set of variables y. So if I actually prove this Cauchy identity, I will have proved. Uh, that these capital S functions are also symmetric. And uh, then uh, from this, uh, so then, then it is going to have uh, an expansion in terms of monomial symmetric functions. And then this uh, lemma here I've proved about dominance where mu is actually not a, necessarily a partition, but uh, any uh, uh, weak composition will actually imply also uh, this first property. So the main thing to do is to prove this Cauchy identity. Okay. So, so uh, we will prove the Cauchy identity. So the proof of the Cauchy identity uh, that I will give rests on uh, what is called the RSK correspondence, the robinson chen state knuth correspondence. So into a semi-standard Young tablet. So, um, I'm sorry, it's not clear to me why it's obvious that they are symmetric the right hand side if the left hand side is symmetric. I guess you can take the coefficient of any S lambda of X or of any monomial in S in inside S lambda of X and check it's a symmetric in the Y's. Or every so, yeah, but maybe uh, the real thing is point is that uh, this where does this where does all this happen? Lambda tensor lambda, where I think of this as symmetric functions in x and this as symmetric functions in y. So because the left hand side is symmetric in x for every fixed y and vice versa. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe Apurva's answer is also correct. Uh, Sorry, I'm not convinced, but uh, we can do it later. Not What's the question? The question is, wh why does the symmetry of the left-hand side imply huh. the symmetry of the right-hand side? Well, if I interchange two of the variables in the left-hand side, two of the x variables, I will be also interchanging two of the x variables in the right-hand side, right? No. You can individually permute because each each single x i y j comes. No, no, it, you only permute the x variables amongst themselves and the. Uh, yeah, so if you interchange x one and x two. Yeah. yeah keep... So the left hand side is symmetric. That's not the issue. Raghavan is asking why, if the left hand is, side is symmetric, the right hand side is symmetric, and I believe that's uh, 
uh, fairly uh, that's because uh, 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 that's because if if i have uh, if i have you know uh, uh, i have oops this is not over s this is over lambda if i have some over lambda in general uh, okay there's some uh, issue here in the sense uh, you a priori don't know what s lambda is we don't know that uh, s lambda is a basis for symmetric functions which was part of the reasoning earlier mm -hmm. uh, yeah so but uh, okay i'll i'll just think about it a bit maybe later uh, i see your point now. yeah we can post there is certainly a question there because earlier when we uh, looked at these kinds of things we assumed that these things form a basis of symmetric functions and so, uh, yeah. But if there are dependencies here, like, you know, confounded both these things. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's some slight issue here. Uh, okay. So maybe it will become clear. Uh, let's, let's just see. When you prove one, then won't you get a basis? Hmm. Yeah, but then one kind of depends on showing that it's a symmetric function and my uh, ah, okay. uh, <laughs> my uh, sort of uh, strategy was to prove two and then conclude that it's a symmetric function and then. Ah, okay. So maybe there's some circularity here. Uh, but uh, I still, uh, yeah, yeah, so. Okay, but this RSK correspondence gives uh, actually a finer thing, in fact. So, so let's just do that in a second, and then we'll uh, talk about it. So, uh, so it 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 should probably follow from one of the it should follow from the RSK correspondence. So, so the main thing is uh, what is known as insertion. So, uh, let me start with an example and then explain the algorithm. So I have a semi-standard Young Tableau. So I'll take the example that I had earlier. And what I want to do is I want to insert uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert three into P. So P insert three will be a new tab. It will be of a size, a little one more box. It will be a partition one larger than the original tableau. And uh, so, so the method is the following. So you, you have this three and you want to put it in the first row. Uh, and you want to maybe uh, if uh, you may need to uh, throw out something from the first row. So what you do is uh, you scan the first row uh, from left to right. Then uh, when you find a term that is greater than, so let's say I'm inserting uh, some number A into a tableau of P. When you find a box containing a number greater than A, what you do is uh, replace, uh, put A into that box. So with the first box containing a number greater than a so you're scanning from left from left to right put a into that box and bump out the content of the box the original content of the box so in this case uh, what happens is uh, let me just make a copy of this Oops. 
So I, I have this uh, three that I'm trying to insert. And what happens is that this is the first uh, box where, um, which is greater than. So what I'll do is I will replace this by three. And I will bump out five. Okay, then what you do is, you, uh, okay, but it's possible that, uh, it's possible that uh, there is no such box containing a number greater than A. That means the last number in this row is less than or equal to A, in which case uh, you just put, add a box containing A at the end of the question. This is the first row. Okay, but in this case, that did happen. It may happen later. And now what you do is you take this number that you've bumped out and uh, so uh, bump out the content, let's call that uh, A prime. And now insert A prime into R2. And then if something is bumped out, you insert that into R3 and so on. So let's continue this. So now I want to bump this five into the second row. So what will happen is the first time something greater than five, so that is six. So this six has to come out and uh, this uh, five goes in here. And now again, what we see is that this has to come out. So I'll put six here and then eight has to go in here. But now we see that eight is greater than or equal to all the entries in this row. So the eight comes to rest here. So uh, if you compare this with the old tableau, so, uh, so this, uh, maybe I want to write it like this. Um, so what I'm saying is insertion of three into this is equal to this and uh, and uh, this is a new box that has been added. So after insertion, you get a new shape, which has one box more than the previous shape. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, uh, okay, so, okay, so that's how it works. And now uh, the main lemma regarding this uh, insertion algorithm is the following. So, on it the main lemma. So this lemma tells us what happens if you insert two numbers, one after the other. Then, so if we have first A and then we have B, if A is less than or equal to B, then uh, upon insertion, of uh, uh, into T. Uh, so what we are saying is we take, uh, we take um, in this order. So we do A first and then we insert T. So uh, uh, on insertion, maybe I'll just write it this. Uh, the, the new box, introduced by B lies strictly to the right of the new box introduced by B. And there's a dual to this statement. Uh, 
which is that if a is greater than b then the new box uh, introduced by b lies strictly uh, below the new box so that the changes here are this and to the right becomes below Okay, um, just one more thing I forgot to say, which was about the reversibility of uh, the strictly above. Sorry, I'm confused. Strictly below. That means in a row below. First, so, so let's let's just uh, look at an example here. So, uh, so maybe I'll give an example of the strictly below phenomenon. So here we introduced, uh, we inserted three into uh, this tableau. So let's try now inserting two into this tableau. So let's take this and let's try inserting two into it. So now what will happen? So if I have to take this, then this will go away and uh, this will have to become a two. And now I'll insert a three here and this will go away and this will become a uh what was this here four is it yeah four so this will become a three and now this uh four has to go in here so this will become uh what was okay a four and then a five has to go in here so this will become a five and in fact this four will get bumped out and so it will come to rest over here in a row strictly below so this there is was now... some mistake there hello yeah so, yeah the four uh, should have bumped the eight the okay. five should have bumped uh let me go back five should bump the eight you're absolutely right so so what i'll get is five here and then the eight comes to this here so now the new box introduced is this and it's in a row strictly below the new box introduced by the insertion of three. Okay, so it's 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 uh, if uh, if the first thing you insert is strictly greater than the second thing, then the new box is strictly below. If it's uh, less than or equal to, then the new box is strictly to the right. Um, so the proof is not very difficult. Uh, I'll I'll uh, leave it to you to check it uh, in the tutorial session, perhaps. Um, it's it's really not very difficult. So for this the for this below thing, the point is that you must realize that up from the last row where you added the box, something definitely gets bumped, and so the new box will be in a row below it. So so that's uh, one thing. And the other thing I want to talk about is uh, the reversibility of this insertion. So uh, again, if I start with this, and I know so. So let's uh, uh, talk about reversibility, which I think. So I want to know what happened. So I know that I got this and I want to know where did it come from? And I know that this, this was the new box. This, this, uh, this box containing eight was the new box which means that uh, this box, that means that eight was inserted here, right? And that there was nothing here. So there was nothing here and eight was inserted. So which means that uh, eight was uh, bumped out here. Okay, these, these colors, I don't know, three, five, six, I don't really know. I only knew the new box. So, so the question is, uh, who could have, uh, bumped out an eight and uh, the answer is well it couldn't have been the five because the six is also uh, uh, less than eight so so it has to be this six so so i know that uh, the six uh, got in here and there used to be an eight over here and now the question is who could have bumped out the six and so uh, the rule is that you look for the last entry that is strictly less than 
uh, the guy that uh, uh, you have uh, bumped out. And so it must have come from this five. And so, uh, so this must have been a six here, which got bumped out by a five. And uh, then you look for a last entry that's strictly less than whatever got bumped out. And so that's a three. And so this must have been a five and it have come from inserting a three. And so, so now if you look at this, this is actually the same as what I have here. This matches with this. So the process is reversible if you know the new box that was added. So, so two important points to note about insertion. One is that uh, the process is reversible if you know which box was added. And we also know the order in which uh, the boxes were added. Okay, so now I can prove um, the RSK correspondence. <coughs> So, um, so it's uh, uh, so it's it's actually an algorithm. So it's given by um, so there, there are two things. Uh, one is the uh, integer matrices. So uh, let M nu nu denote the set of matrices. A I J. So let's say mu has mu is um, mu one mu n mu is mu one mu n. So this is an m by n matrix where all the A I Js are non-negative integers and uh, summation. A i j sum over all j. The row sums are given by mu, and the column sums are given by mu. Then uh, the RSK correspondence is an algorithm. That associates. a bijection m lambda mu to disjoint uh sorry m mu nu to a disjoint union over partitions lambda now one thing you have to note is that if you have such a matrix then the sum of mu's should be equal to the sum of mu's so this uh, set lambda will run over partitions of the same uh, number, which is the sum of mu's and the sum of mu's. So that's, uh, that's what the RSK correspondence does. And uh, let me describe this algorithm. So, um, Okay, so maybe I should have uh, said something more that follows from here. So uh, here what we've seen is that we have A less than or equal to B, then what happens? So what if you have uh, A1 less than or equal to A2 less than or equal to and so on AM and you do first to insert A1, then you insert A2, then you insert A3, and so on. And uh, finally, you insert AM. Then, the new boxes um, uh, appear in a left to right order, strictly moving from left to right. And uh, you can actually reverse the whole uh, insertion process if you just know what the original shape was uh, by iterating uh, by iterating this reversibility algorithm here, 
if you know so you have your original shape say uh, uh, lambda to which you did a sequence of inversions then the new boxes would appear from uh, from uh, left to right so maybe you would have one box here then you would have one box here and then you would have some boxes here maybe and uh, then you would know that uh, this box appeared first, this box appeared next, this box appeared next, and this box appeared next. So sequentially, you can do this reversibility and recover uh, not just the original tableau that you started with, but also the sequence of uh, integers a1, a2, an. So what we see is that the RSK correspondence, uh, this insertion algorithm gives rise to there is a bijection. This uh, in, by inserting again and again from uh, uh, tab lambda cross. Okay, so maybe I should. Uh, okay, okay. So let R M A be the set of all A one less than or equal to A one. So um, these are greater than or equal to one, less than or equal to. So Rm of maybe not little a, I can call it Rm of uh, some capital. So letters from the al alphabet one to n uh, in weekly m tuples, a uh, weekly increasing m tuples. And so there's a bijection from uh, SSYT lambda. Um, and cross R M N. So by doing this insertion, you will get uh, an SSYT of shape mu. So, but the shape mu is uh, not predetermined by lambda, uh, but it, you need to know both these components. So it will be a disjoint union depending on this. Uh, I'll say more about what this sum mu is, SSYT. Mu where mu minus lambda has is a, it's called a horizontal strip. This just means that if you take the Young diagram of mu, uh, it has at most one new box compared to the Young diagram of lambda. So, i.e., uh, Young diagram of mu. contains diagram of lambda and at most one new box in each column. I e the diagram of mu contains at most one box that is in each column that is not in the diagram of lambda. And this is a bijection. So, uh, okay, so we'll be using this also. Okay, so now I am ready to uh, describe the RSK correspondence, uh, which is as follows. So you have a matrix. So Henry, I'm confused. You when yeah. you write, uh, what does capital N mean? Capital N is some uh, positive integer, and that's going to be the number of variables that we're. Uh, using in, in uh, uh -huh. because you wrote SSYT lambda mu on the one hand, SSYT lambda yeah, yeah. n on the other hand. Yeah, so entries are maybe I should, should cap entries mm -hmm. are less than or equal to n. There's some uh, overloading of uh, notation, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So here, uh, of course, uh, maybe I should, uh, yeah. So the mu and u tell you what the m and n are. Okay. So in this, in this case, so starting with the matrix AIJ, you form a bi vector. What is the meaning of a bi vector? It's, it's basically, uh, so I1, J1, 
so I, I'll just. Uh, uh, so what is a by vector? It means that. Uh, uh, let me just write down what you form. So, so you take. Um, one, one repeated. A one one times. So maybe there is A one one is zero, in which case you don't write that at all. Then you take one two repeated A one two times, and then you take one three, and so on, and then after that you go on to two one. Two, two, and so on. All the way down to uh, MN. So, what you're doing is you're reading the matrix uh, along its rows and you're putting down the, uh, 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 the positions of the uh, entries. Uh, but each position, I, comma, J, you're putting down A, I, J many times. And now, what you do is you start with the, so there, there are two things that you get in the RSA correspondence. One is the insertion tableau. And the other is the recording tableau. So uh, what you do is you start with the empty tableau. And then you insert the, uh, the second row of the by vector sequentially into it. So insert the second row. Maybe it's easier to uh, work with an example. So let me uh, let me uh, let me first uh, also write down an example. So uh, we have this. Uh, let's say we take this matrix one zero two two one zero. Two, zero, zero. So then this matrix, the by word that I will write down is one, one occurs once, one, two doesn't occur at all, one, three occurs, then I get two, one twice, two, two once, and then I get three, one, two times. So this is the by word. And now what I'll do is I'll insert the second row sequentially, starting with the empty tab. And that will give me the uh, insertion tablet. So, so first I will take this one and I'll insert it into the empty tablet. So I'll just get one. And what I'll do is uh, at the location where the new box appeared, record the corresponding entry of the first row. So, um, so now I will uh, record. So I have, uh, so this is usually called P and this is called Q. So my P at the first stage is uh, this and Q I record. So it happened in the first box in the first row, I have added a new box. So I'll take this one and put it there. So now we have uh, now we have taken care of uh, uh, this uh, thing. So now the next we have to work with the three. So if I insert the three into this P, then I will get uh, one three, and then uh, the new box I've inserted is uh, is uh, here. Uh, so sir, sir, three should be two times, right? Uh, oh yeah, you're right. Thank you. one more one three yeah. and so uh, again next time i get one three three and here i get one 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 and then uh, so now i have finished uh, till here 
now I have to insert this one into this. And now something interesting happens. I get one, one, three, and this three comes here. Okay, it gets bumped up here. So new box inserted is here. And so now I get one, 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 and I put the two over here. And uh, then I see, uh, so this is done. And again, another one. So this will push this three also to the second row. So, uh, well, okay, maybe I should write it in a new. So I get one, 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 three, three. And here I get one, 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 two, two. Okay, so that takes care of this. And now I have a two. It just comes to rest at the end of the first row. And so now I add this two over here in the new position. And now I am going to put a one, so that will bump up uh, this two. Uh, and then the two will bump up this three. So the new box has come here. And so now I must take this. I don't change the old entry here ever. Uh, but now I get a three here. And then again, I'm adding a one. But now this time, this one just comes to rest at the end of the first row. And so here I get one, 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 three, two, two. So this is P and this is P. And uh, it's not difficult to see that this uh, process is uh, reversible because uh, now from the locations of these threes, I know uh, where the new boxes came from the third row. And so because of that, I can use this uh, lemma here, this reversibility of uh, the adding of uh, increasing, weekly increasing sequence. And so I take the, uh, I first take, I know that the last box with the, with the, from the third row was here. So I just remove this one. And then I know the next box from the third row was here. So I remove this three and I'll get uh, three one, uh, one three. I'll get my entry one three, which I'll put in the matrix. And then with the twos, I can do the same thing. I'll know which order the boxes uh, from the recording tableau. I'll know that in which, uh, from which rows and in which order uh, the boxes, uh, the, 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 the numbers got inserted and I will be able to reverse this whole algorithm. So this is a bijection. So, so this is a bijection basically because of uh, this lemma here. So this implies that RSK is reversible. So I can reverse RSK because I can figure out where things came from. So, uh, so, so this is Sir, uh, slightly, I don't understand this. This is in Q you have three, two times, right? Yeah. So how do you know that uh, which uh, from which three I have to start like? Okay, because of uh, here, uh, if you, so I inserted the J's uh, in weekly increasing order because I start from left to right, right? So first all the ones will be inserted, then all the twos will be inserted and so on. Uh, okay, so by this lemma. You yeah, so I know that those boxes would be in left to right order. So the rightmost box with a three in the recording tableau is the last box. Uh, from the third row. Yeah, okay, so thank you. And so I'll know what the, yeah, exactly. So, so maybe, uh, you know, you can try to take this and work backwards. So exercise is work backwards from here. So, um, so what we get is, uh, so I claim that this bijection, uh, it, it in terms of- uh, Sorry, term, Amri, yeah. in this process, uh, why is Q a semi, why is Q semi-standard on this? Is that clear? Um, yeah, so uh, uh, how uh, hard is it to see that? Um, well, it requires a little bit of argument. So let me see if uh, the boxes are, uh, uh, the new boxes are going to appear. Um, it follows from your little lemma that they will appear in right. a horizontal strip. Yeah. So whenever you add a larger number in a horizontal strip, 
uh, you get a semi-standard tableau from it. So if I have this uh, semi-standard tableau and I take at most one box in each row, in each column, and I put fours down there, then it would still be semi-standard because the fours are each appearing only once in each column. So you have to, you cannot have a weekly increasing uh, thing on the fours. So uh, what you can think of as a semi-standard tableau is equivalently a chain of Young diagrams such that every subsequent pair in that chain differ by a horizontal strip. And here, this lemma says that uh, the, the uh, when upon adding each new row, the difference is a horizontal strip. I'm confused. You're not adding to Q, you're adding to P. Yeah, but I'm recording the boxes that I'm add. Uh, I'm inserting into P and I'm adding to Q the number, the row number in those corresponding boxes. Right, so here you see, uh, we had a one, 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 two, two, and then these two new boxes came with the threes. But these boxes are in different columns. So they will not violate uh, the strict inequality condition because they're all in different columns. See, if I had a three below a three, that would violate the condition of inequality. And I'm adding the largest numbers. Certainly it cannot be, you know, weak inequality cannot be violated. So I hope that uh, okay, I'll, I'll think about it. I'm not because those three. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm being slow. But I guess I, I'm. Uh, I mean, I can do this also. But uh, maybe others have the same problem. That's why I'm insisting. Yeah, so, as Arun uh, said, it is a consequence of this lemma. Uh, this this part here, this first part. Uh, sticky. Okay, uh, because up here I said that it is strictly to the right. So since no two of these boxes appear in the same column, uh, I, when I'm inserting the i throw, no two i's will appear in the same column, and therefore there will be strict increase along the columns. Okay, and now this uh, this uh, Cauchy identity is just a generating function interpretation of the RSK correspondence. So, um, so Cauchy So uh, what you do is given a matrix, you say weight of A is uh, X product X I Y G raised to the power A I G and uh, and then what we are saying is R S K is a weight preserving bijection from uh, M mu nu to SSYT. By construction, the shapes of those two tableau will be. Uh, will be the same and also the weights will match up because the numbers we are inserting are actually counting the sums of the rows and columns. So, so, so it's a, it's a weight preserving bijection. And uh, then it's not very difficult to see that uh, when you sum this over all mu and nu, you actually get uh, the Cauchy identity. So, 
because this is just a multi set of entries of the matrix. If you take then this is the generating function for a multi set of entries of the matrix, which is actually you count the multiplicity by the AIJ. And this right hand side is clearly uh, the sum of the shoot functions. So this, uh, this Cauchy identity is a generating function manifestation of the RSK. Did you mean capital S lambda here? Uh, capital S lambda, thank you. So modulo, I think Raghavan's uh, valid question, since I'm conflating the symmetry and so on, I have uh, proved uh, these two, uh, I have proved uh, these two uh, properties from which it follows that uh, capital S is actually equal to small s. So sorry. I just think- Could you yeah. remind why one follows again? I forgot. Uh, I'm sorry, what was your question? Why one follows? Yeah, so uh, so if you if you are uh, uh, okay with uh, it being symmetric, then this one follows because of this uh, fact that if you have a semi-standard Young table of shape lambda and weight mu, then lambda is greater than or equal to mu. And there's one more point that I need to say: if lambda equals mu, then there is only one semi-standard table. Uh -huh. one SSYT of shape lambda and weight also lambda equals So, uh, and that's the tableau with ones in the first row, twos in the second row, threes in the third row. Okay, so maybe uh, I leave it at that and I'll just uh, think with a cooler head about uh, the symmetry issue. Uh, I, I'll send you an email uh, clarifying that. Maybe I should, stop, but we can discuss this. Any more questions, comments? Can I ask, does anyone know if this is similar arguments for McDonald polynomials? In other words, an RSK for McDonald polynomials. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think that's a dream. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, did anyone try or is it just a dream? Yeah, I don't know if anybody has even tried. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what about for Hall Littlewood symmetric functions? Uh, uh, no. Before you get, uh, 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 Arun, uh, what do you mean by RSK for McDonald polynomials? What, what, at least one side, what did you mean? Can you be more? Uh, well, McDonald has a, a formula for the symmetric McDonald polynomial, P lambda, as a sum over column strip tableau with some weights in front of it. So, in that sense, I have a, a formula for, for P lambda where there is one term for each column strip tableau. And so one could, and then McDonald also has Pieri rules where you take P lambda times PR times a row and you multiply them and you get a sum over horizontal strips. So one could ask whether these rules, this Pieri rule could be proved by an analog of RSK insertion. Or if you could somehow modify the usual RSK insertion to keep track of the weights along the way. Um, but I never thought about it. It didn't occur to me until I was listening to Omri's nice talk and then I asked the question of myself. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. I would have uh, guessed that you start with the Cauchy identity and I mean the analog of the Cauchy identity from the ground. So is there an RSK proof of the Cauchy identity for McDonald? No, I mean, one could try and I mean, uh -huh. that would be yeah. the way I would attack the problem, yeah. but I, I don't know if anybody has succeeded. I, 
I doubt it. Uh -huh. So I think the symmetry should follow from RSK because uh, uh, if you permute uh, the, the clearly the, uh, yeah, the thing is somewhat confounded because you have to, but I do believe it should just follow from the RSK because if, if you permute the rows of the matrix, then you're permuting the mu, the entries of mu. And uh, yeah, it's still not yeah, I'm not really sure what the confusion was. I mean, why is why? So you're saying the equation number two does not prove symmetry of Schur functions? I'm a bit confused. So uh, Raghavan is saying that it could be. I think. Let me just try to say what uh, Raghavan is worried about. So it could be that these s lambda y's are not linearly independent. Say, right? And so just having. Let me see. Does that even make sense? Uh, so why why would it be uh, separately symmetric in each x and in each y? So suppose you interchange x one and x two. Right. The left hand side is symmetric. Then this yeah, and this whole sum is symmetric. So it's and possible that uh, you know each term is not invariant under interchanging x one and x two, but somehow this sum is independent. But it's if you put a monomial of weight lambda in x. Then but what? this, you know, you could have two y's here. So, uh, so for example, if these were all equal, right? In the most extreme case, these s lambda y's were all degenerate and became one or something. Then you're just saying that the sum That's of the symmetric is. functions is uh, is uh, the sum of uh, these s lambdas is symmetric. No, no, but you have freedom of choosing whatever y's you like. So you could set y one equal to one and y. Or whatever. Yeah, but then I think you would need to know something of the independence of these things, linear independence of these things. Yeah, how do you equate the individual terms? That is where the linear yeah. independence. But maybe the linear independence follows from. Uh, uh, so you are using two to prove one, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I would say, uh, but maybe there's scheme, a better way to do the whole thing. Yeah. So from the there's a easy not not entirely, but there's a easy proof of uh, symmetry of S lambda starting from the semi-standard tableau definition. It's an involution on tableau. No, no. So there are proofs. I want to say it just comes from the RSK. Ah, so, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Otherwise, LGB will give you some proofs. But... Yeah, that will also give them another way. Of yeah, yeah, there are uh, many proofs. It's a question of doing it this way. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, Satish was saying that there's a nice proof in this paper by Cambridge, which is probably the one Arjun is talking about. Uh, it, it's Bend up All... proof evolution. Okay, so this is yes. So yeah, so there are many proofs. I just uh, thought that you know, given that we already know about this Cauchy identity and so on, the simplest way to go to the by uh, our SS uh, semi-standard Young tableau would be to use the RSK. But there seems to be a slight uh, hiccup here. And I'll figure that out. Then. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, so let's thank Kamri other way. So, uh, how many of you use your last lecture? Or? Yes, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks, Amri, for giving this wonderful lecture. Okay, then I'll stop recording.